Hi there, my name's Tim, but most of you probably know me as the Orange Doom. This is me three years ago, where I was spending pretty much 10 hours every single day playing video games. I was a full-time content creator on YouTube, I was a full-time streamer over at Twitch, and I was having an absolute blast. I mean, I was making money, I was meeting tons of new people, and I got to do all of that from the comfort of my computer chair. The problem is that I was addicted. I was addicted heavily, and the problem about addiction is that most of the time you don't really realize that you are addicted. Or well, we tend to sort of brush it off and say, we're well, having a good time. But it wasn't always like that. You see, I was born in 1997, so, well, by a lot of definitions, I do kind of fall into the entry-level Generation Z. Um, my generation was still quite old-fashioned. I live in the outskirts of the main capital of Slovenia, and a lot of my peers really spent most of our free time riding bikes, um, you know, playing football and hide-and-seek, eating dirt, you know, dumb stuff that kids do. But the same way that you outgrow your clothes, you also outgrow certain habits, outgrow certain playstyles, certain toys. And the era of video games was upon us. It started pretty simple with games I remember like Hercules, Bugs Bunny Lost in Time, these, you know, Lego Racers springs to mind. And then in early 2000s, I was introduced to Need for Speed Hot Pursuit 2, which together with the soundtrack, the, well, at the time, amazing graphics, is still to this day one of my favorite games of all time. And slowly but surely, these video games also brought together different groups of people. Certain kids that I would have never hung out with, we were now taking turns on the computer in school during recess, playing, um, well, anything really. And the kid who would bring the brand new CD, or damn, the kid who could actually get hold of cheat codes, you were treated like a god among men. The year is now 2007, and all of my friends, and I mean everyone, was playing it. RuneScape. I don't know how it came about, but I think what happened was that somebody must have been on Miniclip, they must have found the game, they must have clicked on it out of curiosity, and it just spread like wildfire. There was something incredibly satisfying and addicting about being able to build your own character, decide what skills you're going to train, what quests you're going to partake on, you know, what kind of character you're going to really build. It allowed you to play around with more than just, oh, what are you going to be when you grow up? You know, that classic question that's that's put forth to kids. And there was one hidden thing with RuneScape that I think to this day has not properly been thanked. And that's English. I mean, it's not to say that we were bad at English, it's just that none of us really cared for it. You know, we don't speak English in school, so why would we learn it? Ah, uh, well, you could learn it because you want to play this game and you want to get better at it. So it was a, it was a weird conditioning, but for certain, I think 90% of us that were, you know, playing, dare I say, as a child full time, uh, yeah, it, we improved a lot because in this game you can explore uh, by examining everything. You know, so if you see a bucket on the floor and you're not sure what the fuck a bucket is and you examine it, you know, it will, it will give you a description with which you can then hopefully understand what a bucket is, you know, or what a rake is, or what a hoe is. I mean, Merry Christmas, but I learned this way before Minecraft became a thing. And amidst the spree of grind that was occurring between most of my friends, where we were spending less and less time riding bikes or playing football or, you know, eating dirt, and we were spending more and more time sitting behind our computers just, you know, clicking the same tree over and over again, um, I had actually a crash. I crashed my bike into the side of a car, suffered a concussion, didn't remember the last 50 seconds of whatever had happened, and, um, well, I didn't have to go to school. So, with a broken collarbone, I was sitting on the couch all day and just uh, playing on my laptop, so I was grinding like an absolute baboon, and I think that's when it kind of started. I think that was the, the beginning of the end, we could say. That's where everything manifested into the whole, uh, whichever hemisphere of brain is responsible for, uh, child addictions in uh, clicking the same thing over and over again because that's where it happened and uh, I don't regret a thing. We have to go back to September in 2012. What happened was that my laptop was starting to die. RuneScape had died because it received an update that just turned the game upside down and I 
was in high school now. So suddenly there were, you know, hot chicks to look at and there was exams that we were failing and it, it, sort of life took a different turn. Um, but, you know, in a positive way. Obviously, I remember high school as a very, very positive uh, time of my life. 2013 rolled around a corner and I got my first desktop. And I was really excited about this because, you know, it's a big deal when you, when you get your first proper computer and you're like, well, now I can actually play stuff. And then you got nothing to play. I, I, you know, I, I grew up with miniclip, like I said. I grew up with these, you know, simple games you could run on a on a toaster. And here I was with a proper computer, and I just didn't have anything to play. And this one day, um, I was on a Skype call with my buddy JJ. This is, you know, back in the day there was no Discord. Um, so we're having a, a conversation, and all I can hear is just the the sound of 50 cows and arcade freaking biplane spinning around, you know, back in patch 1.1.9. Through speakers, it was a horrendous sound, and I was actually getting a bit annoyed by it. And he kept saying, "Like, oh, you got to try this game out. You got to try this game out." And about a week later, I caved in. I, I said, "Fuck it." I downloaded it and I, I gave it a try. Um, three months later, I went out and I bought the biggest pack that Walton had. I mean, back in the day, there were like just five packs you could buy. One of them was the other four in one pack. So. <laughs> It was a simpler time back then, yeah. I think the entire thing cost less than less than 80 euros, which, you know, is absurd, considering that now you pay 60 for just one vehicle, and back then it was a pack of, I think, five plus one, something like that. Now, the timing of this purchase was absolutely perfect. The summer vacation just started, so, you know, three months of grinding time, and Gaijin came out with what was to be the first in a series of events called Something Summer, right? Now, back in the day, it was quite simple. We had arcade battles, we had historical battles, not realistic battles, and we had full real battles and not sim. So the, the namings were a bit different, the game modes also were a little bit different, uh, but back in the day, everybody was in arcade. The tasks were really simple, because there were none. It was just get 1,250 kills in arcade, and you unlock the plane. So that's what I did. I took the Aero Cobras, the Hellcat, grinded the shit out of it in arcade, and I got myself the A26C. Now after that, I spent a few months sort of uh, playing around with video editing software and I was trying to upload some content to YouTube and I realized that there was going to have to be commentary. So I got myself a shitty mic and I, I used the A26C and recorded my first commentary. And I'm going to leave it on top of the description as a link. Uh, it's cringy, it's bad, but it shows six years of progress. And that, I'm proud of. Now, before we can officially close a chapter on this seven-year story of War Thunder, I wanted to first go down and crunch some numbers with you. Hopefully these will help uh, put things into perspective, will answer some questions about why it's so difficult to quit a video game. In my case, it wasn't until I wrote down the numbers that it started hitting me. So, I'm currently 23 years old and I spent seven years of those 23 years playing this game. That is... 30%. Okay, that's the same percentage that in a lifetime you spend sleeping. And all of that still isn't too concerning until the big number rolls in. And the big number was 10,000. It's not 10,000 kills, it's not 10,000 games, it's, it's 10,000 hours. Now in real life we have different artisan crafts, different skill sets. And for these, there is a common rule that at 10,000 hours spent developing that craft, you become a master at it. So, say that you wanted to learn how to bake bread. At 10 hours, you would be a pretty bad bread baker. But at 1,000 hours, you could probably say that you would be pretty damn decent at it. You know, you'd be an expert, as they say. And at 10,000 hours, there's likely nothing left there to surprise you. There's very little, you know, statistical chance that you're going to make a mistake in it. Um, if you spend 10,000 hours playing chess, you would likely be a pretty good chess player. But in the video game world, there doesn't seem to be anything sort of grabbable. There doesn't seem to be anything that really stands out at the end. You may be an outstanding player, you may have outstanding results, statistics, but at the end of the day, what do you really have to show? Because, I mean, carpal tunnel, swampy ass, and a bad eyesight because you kept staring at a screen all day, 
ain't no panties getting dropped because your KD is 5.0, right? But, I mean, look, brutal honesty aside, there are still numbers that I'm extremely proud of. And I think it has to do with the fact that the the gaming content creator and, and live streaming community, the outreach that it has, the experience that it creates, is it's one of a kind. It truly is unique, and I don't think that it exists in other aspects of, of life. I mean, what else is there where you can simultaneously connect with thousands of people from all around the world, of different ethnicities and cultures and preferences, and you have, you know, in the same chat, you have somebody who hates you and somebody who adores you and somebody who's sort of, you know, somewhere in the middle, and it just allows for a discourse that you don't get elsewhere. I think that the mixture of the anonymity of the internet and the, the freedom of speech, it, it's wonderful, and I'm really happy that I was able to go through this experience. But with that said, there has to be a difference made between, for example, a hobby, a job, and a career. Because the way it started for me was it was a hobby. I wasn't really making any money from it, but it was something that I enjoyed spending time. Then it turned into a job. It was like, you know, hey, I can actually make a living out of this, right? So what I did was I was constantly playing with this back and forth. Is it something worth committing to? And it took a long time, but I came to realization that this is not a career path. What does that mean? It means that as a source of income, it's something that I could see myself doing for a set of, say, five years. But in terms of a career path, which is long term, we're talking 20, 30, 50 years in certain cases. Um, this is not a field within which I would really want to operate. Technology is constantly um, shifting, but more so the market is and the rules and the legislations and You've probably heard about, you know, Twitch issuing DMCA takedowns where half of the Twitch clips that we had were now deleted. You know, those are memories. Those are things that I think people cherish and they come back and they will rewatch them and it brings back brings back good memories. Um, you know, YouTube with their advertisement policies and, and continuous censorship. This is something that I'm personally quite afraid of, right? I'm a huge advocate for freedom of speech and... And for me to be working in an environment where I'm not allowed to say everything that I want and I have to be politically correct and sort of, you know, walk on this tightrope, this constantly shifting pad of ice, never knowing if it's going to flip over and just engulf me underneath, it's, I don't like that. It creates an unsafe environment, it's not an enjoyable place to work with, and usually it just manifests bitterness. I think the idea of a story surrounding a content creator is usually filled with stories of fame and fortune and glory and all these positive aspects. When you look at a streamer and you realize that he is in control of thousands of people in his chat, that he can ban them at will, that he can read the comments and answer and joke around and be both positive and negative, that he can imply this emotional roller coaster for all these people. It's, it's astounding. It's almost like you're the, the, the leader of a theater, you know, or that you're in, in charge of a show or something. It's, it's hard to describe once you've experienced both sides. But we live at times now where, you know, kids go into primary school addicted to their smartphones. You have toddlers who are unable to eat their morning cereal without looking at cartoons on their mama's iPad. These are things that we're going to have colossal issues. I think kids that are growing up today are going to have serious issues with mental health. We are slowly but surely getting addicted to these, you know, short but very intense dopamine releases from likes and comments and all of the effects that we get from the internet. It's all very short-lived and frankly, we don't really have that much scientific evidence to explain to us what's going to happen in five or ten years time, how our brains, how a child's brain is adapting to this type of you know, release of emotions and, and dopamine. 
ultimately, a content creator, you have to understand this, throws away a lot of things in order to be able to create entertainment value for other people from around the world. You're throwing away, uh, you know, time to socialize, time to grow a healthy relationship. You don't really have time to have a healthy diet or to develop other skills, to tune into different types of hobbies. You really are slowly but surely dwelling into this dark abyss and it is a frightful sight to see. The journey of, of healing is truly quite a peculiar one because it takes you on this roller coaster of of emotions but most importantly a roller coaster of pain see my journey started two years ago and i was very fortunate to have just had a lot of things fall into place very quickly in a matter of i think two months i had found myself in love with cycling uh, through one of my best friends because he had bought a road bike I got myself into a relationship and she was also into cycling and we both started you know, doing different activities and traveling the country and actually going abroad and visiting concerts and so on. Life was going in an uphill direction at a pace that I think was a little bit too quick. And what was happening is that the same way that you get a release of, of all these positive uh, hormones from social media, it was happening in life. I was getting, I was being ecstatic. You know, it was like a, it was like a sugar rush. Um, was going through my body but of course where there's a high there's also a low and I keep coming back to the quote of the night is darkest right before the dawn in that the night and the waiting for the dawn is almost like representative of the healing of the addiction right the moment when the sun rises is when you're finally cleansed of all this pain and misery and I hadn't realized that at the time, my night hadn't even begun. I was yet to go through the darkest times. I was yet to go through the deepest pains and the, the abyss which I was looking into had yet to show its true colors. At this point, 2020 was just around the corner and nobody could have expected what was about to go down. At that point in time, I was on the very bottom. I was reaching for a hand that didn't exist, I was grasping for air that wasn't there. It, it wasn't a nice place. I really was ready to quit. I was ready to sell my bikes, I was ready to throw in a towel and call it a day. And I don't know what happened, whether it was stubbornness, whether it was just the pain that I felt, that I just refused to give up. I think there was a demon still is somewhere deep inside that refuses to quit, that just refuses. It just manifests on the pain. It feeds on it. It creates strength. It converts the mental pain into physical pain, numbs it, and lets you continue. And it was as though through this salvation of pain that day after day, this weakness that I felt, this sorrow, this sadness and anger was just evaporating and a whole new person was, was being cast into the mold and, and factually created. And long before I knew it, the dark mist was gone, replaced by a white light beaming from above. This was it. We had broken free. I think at this point a question is being posed and that is where's the underlying correlation between video games addiction and cycling how was that leap made how does it make sense and the answer really is 2020 2020 brought to me a best i can describe it as perspective you know in a year where everything went bad where everything was surrounded by negativity and pain and loss and the whole lockdown situation and and the looming sort of doom of COVID, 
I think it brought attention to those things which are most important. And to me, it opened up my mind, objectively speaking, to all these little hints and nuances that were already there. Everything just ties in. It suddenly makes sense. I mean, the first accident that I had was on a bike. My um, metabolism and body type are extremely skinny and, in fact, brilliant for cycling. The addiction that I had with Need for Speed Hot Pursuit 2 when I was a kid was because I loved the open road, I loved the speed, the music, the sort of adrenaline that you get from it. And it makes you feel free, which is also why planes in War Thunder were something that pulled me in like nothing else, because you were able to experience freedom, freedom of almost like being a bird. And consequently this year I fell in love with Formula One because descending is all about hitting the apex and maintaining speed and accelerating out of corners. All this just tied in it, just suddenly life starts to make sense. I think what I've learned is that when there's something that you're good at and you put in the effort and you, you develop a talent and you, you don't quit, when you have consistency in your training, everything else in life starts to make sense as well. When one thing is rolling, the snowball effect of every single thing that you do in life, the confidence is multiplied, the success is multiplied, and ultimately, happiness is inevitable. But for you to truly understand how the leap was made, we have to have a look at the savior at hand, and that was Strava. Strava is a mobile app that cyclists, runners, swimmers, and really any sport activity lovers uh, will use to keep track of their training progress to see what other people are riding and most importantly especially in the 2020 time of a lockdown where racing was difficult to do also compete in essence you could say that Strava is just another social media platform but it differentiates from Instagram for example the exact same way that Twitch live streaming differentiates from YouTube video uploads in that there is no hiding there's no editing to be done on Strava. There's no um, adjusting the numbers, right? You can't just Photoshop. You have to simply perform. And all the information is public. Your heart rate, your cadence, your power meter, if you have one, you know, the speed at which you traveled, the, the average speed, everything there, graphs and, and, and the map where you rode. And because this is all made public, because it takes away that sort of hiding you know the entity that you are has to be put out there in its in its fullest and the journey of everybody on Strava is more or less the same it begins with this desire to be uh, you know fast and efficient and once you think that you're really good and you think you have decent times and you've gone up the local climb and you've given it your all you know your lungs are burning your your heart's about to blow up you feel like you want to fall unconscious and vomit and then you come home and you look at the results and you realize that you're 250th you know, that your best effort was nowhere close to that of the elite. And just like in gaming, when we're faced with this fight or flight scenario, most of the time the ego takes over and we really just sit down and we start grinding. The difference, of course, here is that at the end of that grind, you have more than just numbers. You have a body, you have muscles, you have spirit. Beefsteak, thyme, rosemary, butter, garlic, extra virgin olive oil, season, salt, pepper, hot pan, olive oil, in, steak, sear, Garlic, rosemary, thyme, flip, look at that color, delicious, zoom in on that, butter in, baste, keep basting, baste, baste some more, zoom in on that basting, rest the steak, rest it, let it rest, don't cut into it, rest it. Now for a quick sauce. Pan back on. Cognac. In. Water. Deglaze the pan. Mustard seeds. Butter. Reduce. 
reduce some more. Sharp knife, cut. Sauce, delicious. Steak, done. I've actually been sitting here for hours just trying to figure out figure out how to wrap this whole thing up. Um, there's so much more that I want to tell you, so much more that I want to explore, so many topics and interesting little quirks that 2020 has taught me. You know, I want to sit here and yap about how 2021 will be another great year, but one thing that I started doing is I stopped making promises, especially to myself, because... We don't know. No one knows what's happening. You know, when or if coronavirus will finally get its proper vaccine and we're going to be able to return back to our normal, normal Norway lives. Um, I don't like planning because I think when we plan, things never go according to the plan. So perhaps winging it really is one of the best features, really is one of the best experiences. Now, there are questions, though, that have to be answered. Questions like, what happens to this channel? What happens to the name? What happens to this whole thing we've built? Well, as much as I'd love to say that I'm going to leave it all behind and depart on some self-perfecting journey, um, I won't. In fact, since it's winter and I can't really ride for seven hours every day, I have to find something to fill in the time. And if there's one thing that I do miss, is I miss you. Every single one. So, really, after weeks of planning, I've decided to finally pull the trigger. Make one final hurrah, one little journey into the nostalgia zone, and uh, bring back Twitch. Twitch.tv slash The Orange Doom. It's coming back for the next two months. We'll be streaming three times a week on the old schedule. Those are Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays from 7 to 10 p.m. Central European time. A link to that will of course be available in the description below as well as uh, a link to my Instagram page for those of you who are interested in keeping touch with me on more of a personal level. See what I'm up to, see what I'm doing in daily life and if you do want to reach out that is the best way to do it. And here she is, the final chapter is closed, the book is finished we could say and uh, it's time for us to officially move on with our lives. Since it is a time of the holidays and I have sort of um, delayed this video for so long that it, well, it just so happens to fall around Christmas time. I want to wish everybody a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. I certainly hope that you all enjoyed being part of this journey for the past seven years and, uh, well, got a kick out of this video because, for sure, I enjoyed making it. So, here it goes for the final time. Take care and uh, safe flying.
to go 